Ars Game. Chapter 12, Operation Vokuta. Written by Homura. Soon after my birth my father wanted another child immediately, but my mother's weak constitution prevented him from doing so. Also it will be 18 years that I am only child. At least in a biological way. It's okay Keith you don't have to do the same. My mother said. But if what do you think? After soaking her towel in hot water, I placed it on her forehead. Despite having saved her from tuberculosis, her weak body prevented her from making the slightest effort. Sometimes I would hear people in the camp wondering why my father had chosen to marry such a weak woman. He has answered. Love is not a question of strength or weakness. And I think the same. In my previous world, love was dead, couples divorced or married by pure convention. I hope it didn't happen so soon in this world. So are you better? I asked, handing him a glass of water. Yes thanks. She answered taking it by the way, I heard you and Lars had a fight. Ah oh, shit. It's true that we didn't tell anyone to arouse suspicion. Well actually. I know it's been hard on you since Jesse left, but you have to take it upon yourself and move on. Mom I. Now listen. She said, staring me straight in the eye. Lars Hudson is your best friend and the only man you can trust. Never forget it. I smiled and gave her a kiss on the forehead. Yes, Mom. As I left the tent I had a sort of dazed smile. Spending time with her made me forget the world I live in. At least until a certain person reminds me of it. Hey stop daydreaming fool. Lars said giving me a shoulder. Blanca's team are back. It's not too early. Blanca, yes I know he reminds you of someone. But this one was special. Already he was a nigger and his locks were so long that he could be confused with Predator. More so he had a tattoo under his eye it was creepy. Five years old my eldest was an ultra-silent guy. Since I have known him he must have opened his mouth three times wide at most. In addition to having no presence, he also knows how to draw very well. Since he doesn't like to talk Lars and I have established a code to be able to communicate only between us. You will tell me the beginnings of the walrus. So what is it? He took out a piece of paper which he unfolded widely before showing us what he had drawn. I was amazed every time it looked like he had taken a picture of the place. But this time he had to push the work even further. He had squarely made the image under for different points. Definitely I loved my photographer. Oh la la is that the complex? It is insane. La said are there enough of us to do it? It is not a question of number, but of qualities. I say smiling. Our excuse but our quality is still no match for them. I'm not so sure. Anyway, there was a delay of three days between the departure of my friend Lecter and the return of Blanca. They'll probably make sure he's not a traitor before they cook him. That leaves us a week then. La said. No, they will be there in the next three days. Until then, you have to find a plan. Get to work then. He said. Maggie takes your most discreet guys and flips. Establish communication points across the mountain. It works. She said before leaving the tent. By the way has anyone seen Aisha? I'll need his dogs. She's gone again, it seems. La said. Keith you know what you have to do. It's okay, it's me sticking to it. I took my waistcoat and as I walked out I show a finger to Lars followed by a smile. The Aisha case was special, if I had to describe her I would say that she is my little sister to me. When she was born her tribe offered her to a shaman, where she was to learn witchcraft. Still happy that magic no longer exists in this world. When I found her she was deep in the bark of a tree. They had offered her as a sacrifice to the god of the forest. And guess what, he was a fucking big bear. Come with me. Had I scream. I was still ten at the time and she was about six. 
Totally traumatized, she barely moved. Her expressionless face spoke volumes. There I saw an incredible thing. Huskies appeared out of nowhere and started biting the bear. It was David against Goliath, but with several Davids. In the end the bear calmed down and turned around as the wolfhound surrounded her as if to protect her from me. It was when I saw her in the light that I understood why she was the sacrifice. That's where you were hiding. I said. She was just behind the camp with little Amira who was still trying her hand at archery. Aisha wore a poncho made of animal skin, black cloth pants and leather boots. Her hair was silver like mine and she had a tattoo under her eye. In many ways she reminded me of Blanca. Little Amira was visibly discouraged as Aisha tried to help her. It works hard it seems. Seb Amira yelled. What's the matter? Well then. She said embarrassed. I will soon be ten years old to go hunting. But it turns out that I have no talent for the bow. This man in green helped me a lot, but in the end I can't do it. That's why I asked Aisha for advice since she's the best hunter in the camp. The best hunter? Have I been forgotten since I was no longer on the hunt team or what? Amira repeats to Seb what you heard. Said Aisha in her stoic voice. Um yes. I heard Dad say he was going on a long trip to meet an important friend in the lower zone. What kind of friend? He said he would take us to the other side of the fence and we could live freely. Decidedly children are the biggest hoes in the universe. But thanks to her I was able to avoid a certain catastrophe. I crouched down and slapped him on the head before handing him my gun. Amira takes. But it's. My rifle yes. But I'm lending it to you just for today okay? You will give it back to me later. But. I'm counting on you to take care of it. She nodded and ran straight to the air of shooting. I stood up and stared at Aisha. Her face was still expressionless. Kino Komian is a traitor. She said dryly. It's an old guy. Gatherchal, Lute and Burmuth. I have a job for you. Right now? She asked. I'm joking. I say hugging her. You should go see mom more often you know. I won't. Let me go. Really? I say running my hand through her silver hair. S, stop it. She said embarrassed. But I can do nothing about it. I love to put my hands in her hair. I lifted her squarely and put her on my shoulders. Stop I'm fourteen years old. Exactly. Soon I could not do it again, so I take advantage of it. Hey big brother. Yes? What are you going to do for Amira's father? You just screwed up my mood there. Go talk. I'll talk to him. In the evening I would wait in old Kino's tent while reading a book that I had stolen in an Elysian camp. I felt like a villain for twenty-four hours waiting for his traitor to unveil. Kino stormed in closing behind him. He light his lamp which he hung up and the light made me appear to him. I was sitting in his chair with a knife in my hand and the other a gun. I know everything. I tell him disappointed. Ah, so that will simplify things. I saw him get excited and start packing. You plan to go like that? Far very far. In Valdrade, maybe in Inglesia. But I get away. I'm sick of your stupid fights. Tired of living in a tent. Tired of doing this to Amira. Yes, and then. You think people like us are welcome in this world. Do you really think it will be different elsewhere? I won't know until I try. Open your eyes, it's the hell. I screamed. Silence settled between the two of us. I calmed down and stood up. Sorry. I apologize. Nan it's me who pushes you to the end. It's okay to doubt after all this time. Until then we have played luck and you tell yourself that Elysian the great nation will not let such an affront pass. You may be right. 
but remember the reason we all decided to fight. I threw the book I was reading at him. There was a newspaper article about what niggas were going through outside of Elysian. There is no redemption beyond the borders. We have that here. Look around you. It took the time it took, but look, a little more, and we will succeed. If you get out of here you will put your daughter through hell worse than death. I put the gun down on the table and put my knife in its case. I don't know what this Elysian agent told you, but he lied to you. I say staring at him. If you want to go I won't hold you back, but leave Amira out of it. She deserves better. So what am I supposed to do? He told me. Trust me. I say smirk. I saw in his eyes that he had to revise his decision, at least until further notice. As I left the tent I came across Aisha who was staring at me. Obviously she was already ready to take down old Comian. You are really too nice. She says. But it's not that bad actually. She said with a smile. Oh but you smiled. Go do it again please. You are dreaming, my cheek just bothered me. I saw him smile at you. Just go. Kind? Maybe. The article in question is I who quickly tampered with it by bringing a new page. The old man saw nothing but fire, but I don't know how long it will work. Kino is certainly not the only one in his case, and to prevent this from happening again, the plan must be successful at all costs. You want cookies? We refilled it recently. I'm not a kid anymore. I would miss those little moments. And not just a little because I was going to find myself in the shade for a while. The next day, after speaking with Kino, I ordered the start of the mission. Messages were sent to all of our camps. They should be alert and ready to strike the indicated targets when I tell them, when I say so. And you? Maggie asked. Me? I'm going for a walk in jail. Dimitri, you will come with me. Why me? Because you're the first name that crossed my mind. Come on it's gonna be fun. Fun? The joke is in bad taste in this case. This prison was. Prisoners get off. Cried a man in green. So began my life as a convict. I got out of the back of a truck with my hands tied, followed by a dozen other guys. I turned my head from side to side just to understand the environment I was in. While I still had my eyes unblinded I smirked before quickly regaining my composure. The guy who captured us was keeping his kepi covering his eyes. He was wearing gloves and his hair was pretty silky. Go forward and in a row. In truth it was Lars in disguise. Only the group of my entire prisoner truck came from the camp. It was easy to slip into the line. We were as discreet as possible. Lars in officer's uniform and the others in guard uniform. Like what mixing the races helps a lot. From now on, we don't know each other anymore. There were about fifty newcomers in all. Each lot was separate and well spaced. I saw Lars enter a building, probably to sign a waiver. There an officer landed in the courtyard and stared at us. I'm Colonel Steinberg and from now on I'll be your new boss. Boss? It's a great way to look at it. Yes, because you will work for me from now on. And as boss, I demand from you iron discipline and regular attendance at the task. Those who will prove incapable. Just behind him I saw men swinging in a well before seeing flames rise. Others thought death was instant but I know this method. The well is shallow and the intensity of the flames less. People take half an hour before they burn. Will be used as fuel for our mega factory. As he walked around the prisoners he stared at them, looking for them scared, but he didn't need them because they were all already terrified. As he came to my line our eyes met. I noticed this slight gash on under his left eye. Apparently he had been blown away by an explosion and would have lost his sight on that side. You advance. He ordered me. I did so without forcing. No need for confusion now. What is this mop? 
It's a serious illness sir. In our tribes those who are born like this are considered demons. A demon? Big deal. It's true colonel. One of the prisoners said. Eliminate it or it will bring you bad luck. Whoa eh? He began to laugh softly before bursting into tears. He then put his hand on my shoulder before smiling at me. It's good, I'm one too. Before I noticed he drew his pistol and stuck a bullet in the abdomen of the other prisoner. His smile faded quickly. Take him to the infirmary, he can still be used. He ordered. I knew I feel that we will get along well. Go all this in cellule. This guy was going to be problematic to say the least. As we walked through the forced labor camp I could see Lars come out quietly before driving off with the others. He looked serious in his costume. But hey, I had more immediate concerns. Most of the prisoners looked pretty, clothes torn, covered in dirt, most were blacks, others probably Elysian prisoners, I even saw Tarkovich and Yukonites. As I watched the whole thing one of the prisoners approached me and whispered in my ear. You, you. I saw you get into the truck on your own will. Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. Here was one that was going to be problematic. But one thing is certain he had not hallucinated at all. Shortly before my arrival when we were making the plan. Let's review the plan one last time. Lars said. The target is a research center, they use it to develop new weapons and improve their military power. It has been in service for five years already and we struggled to locate it when it was already under our nose. Just next to a prison. I said. It is about 20 kilometers. The people there literally call it Sturban Death. Some prisoners are used to test the weapons made there. They fuckers have really no morals. Says Oslo. Calm. The plan is to infiltrate the prison and provoke an uprising. Lars said. Is it not a dangerous place? My father asked. More still, we will let the rumor run that Seb was captured. Lars supported. It will destabilize our enemies but also our friends. What will galavnize them during the assault? Where is the interest? My father asked. This is where it gets interesting. An uprising in Sturban will force the nearest garrison to come to their aid to calm the tensions. I explained. Especially if it is the famous Serb which carried it out. Say Aisha. We tend to underestimate my brother's reputation in the north. And during this time we will launch an assault on the enemy research center that we capture. Said Dimitri. I smirked. Dim was far from the truth, but it was almost it. Speaking of him, I jostled him in line as we joined our cells. Hey what are you doing? He growled. Sorry I didn't see you. I say sarcastically. He kicked me in the face with a ball and I nearly collapsed. Even if it was a staging but he hit hard the motherfucker. And you didn't see it coming, eh? He retorted. Wait dirty motherfucker. As we began to brawl the guards disembarked with batons in hand and inflicted severe beating on us. Damn it really hurts in real life but next to my mother's fists it was a mess. Since that's how you're going to live together for a while. They thus threw us into the same cell. We were glaring at each other but the guard arrived with his gun. Don't even dare. We raised our hands up and he stepped back a little before leaving. Once he was far enough away we laughed. Damn you almost blew my nose. Did you shave your head on purpose or what? I say laughing. Close your mouth you hit like a boar. I know a king who died to be killed by a wild boar. But whatever we were in the same cell as planned. Like Lars, Dim was a childhood friend. One of the few not to let his mind mystify the old fool witch. She is still alive by the way. Dim was the gun carrier. He obeyed without asking any questions, but he wasn't stupid. It is because I know his strength and his ability to improvise that I chose him elsewhere. 
So you imagined how our vacation home? Said Dimitri. The pool and spa are missing, but otherwise it's okay. The pool and what? No in fact forget. Tell me instead, what's your plan? A plan as old as the world. We have time. We hope that this lazy boy Lars is on time. He said before lying down. The next day, we were sent to the mines to serve as labor. It was fucking hot, the place was awful, the smell of sweat had filled the air but despite that we were working like crazy. There weren't many guards there, just two guys with one-shot rifles. The job at the mine was simple, digging with a pickaxe, extracting the sand by an old pulley system, at noon to eat our shit rations, return to work and start again until the evening. In the afternoon while I was digging the ground with my pickaxe I was approached by the other guy. He was shorter than me and his face inspired anything but confidence. Hey you remember me. Obviously I didn't know I had more important things to do. I know who you are you are Seb, aren't you? I stopped for a moment and turned to him. My gaze had grown much colder. I was sure of it. Don't worry with me your secret is well kept. I was starting to ask myself questions. I wasn't as good at judging people as Zell, so I was very suspicious, but if I was that guy my priority would be to get away so he had no interest in swinging me. You know this is the fourth time that I escape but I get caught up every time. He said. If only I had found your camp just before. What do you want? Oh damn the big Seb spoke to me. I grabbed his ears with both hands and crumpled them lightly. Speak or you will never hear again. Okay, okay, okay. I let him go and he caught his breath. I know everyone here. I can introduce you to the chefs but it will cost you an arm and a leg to meet them. I want to know the leader of the convicts. Hey you who authorized you to stop? Sorry. We pretended to go back to work and he walked away. In fact, it's Nesta. I don't. I was about to finish my sentence but I saw that one of the ropes that went up the bricks was going to give way. The guy downstairs hadn't noticed and when I saw him my eyes widened. I dropped my pickaxe and rushed at him. With my donation I caught up with him very quickly and kept the guy from being buried. The guys who witnessed the scene remained silent. I was helping the guy up and he stared at me. Seeing me he smiled broadly. Siberio. How are you since last time? Kazima you are far from home my brother. So it's true that the great Seb was captured. Speak less loudly. I whispered to him. For the anecdote Kazima is a friend of Tarkovia. They were given a helping hand in exchange for arms and food. We got along particularly well. It all goes back to about two years ago when my name resonated all over the place. I saw Dimitri landed and seeing him they exchanged a handshake. The guard then arrived. Hey you, I don't want to repeat myself. Go back to work. In the evening I was taken to the Tarkovich district while on leave. Dimitri and I were quite anxious. Do not worry. The boss is a good soul. Pissed off but good. It's supposed to reassure us, eh? Say Dim. If you're there, your little revolution has failed. I'm on a secret mission you know me. The chief's office was in what the prisoners called the lower town. The prison had been built on the ruins of an old colonial era mine at the bottom of a cave and the governor's house served as an office. I do not know who this governor was, but he must have been either Bajo or hyper-isolationist to come and settle here. As I entered I saw a lot of Tarkovich around a table and one of them in the middle with his arms and legs crossed. He had a monocle on his left eye and his head was bald. Seeing his jacket I understood who it was. He stood up and walked over to me. This guy was a head taller yet I'm sure I was in the 90 meter. Who is your new companion Kazima? A man of confidence, Colonel. We fought together in the mountains two years ago. He's a fierce warrior capable of standing up to a bear. The colonel stopped him with a wave of his hand. Welcome comrade. 
he said shaking my hand. What's your name? Everyone calls me Seb decidedly this name has effect everywhere. The Tarkoviches were staring at me, blinking their eyes several times. So it's you who routed the army of Elysian all this time? Considering the exploits that we lend you you should be dead and not locked up. Exact. Colonel Bra, I said trying to read his uniform. Brakiev. But what does it matter, what do you want? I have a plan. To get out of here. To get us all out. I screamed. At that moment all the attention was on me. The guys outside the cells glanced into the colonel's meeting room. You are not serious my friend? Kazima asked. We could not be more serious. But it will be done in blood and tears. It remains to be seen if you will follow me. Well well. That's a good news. Unfortunate that. Dimitri sneezed violently, cutting off the man. At first, we looked at him curious then the colonel and I laughed out loud. You believed it eh? I said. It was funny your joke. I like your nigger humor. Welcome to the gulag disturban. The pleasure is shared. As we moved away from each other my sense of detection told me that this man was dangerous. He was staring at me in a strange way which made it very unpleasant. Later I found myself alone with Kazima and Dimitri. Thank you for your signal Dimitri without you I was rushing into the wall. At least we are fixated on his intentions. Colonel Brakiev is a coward. Kazima said angry. He made a deal with this Steinberg criminal. He runs the prison underground and the other on the surface. So why present it to us? Shouted Dimitri. No no on the contrary. I say putting my hand on the chin. If we enter into open war against Brakiev, Steinberg will be obliged to intervene. It will end in generalized war. Kazima said. How do you plan to defeat these two monsters? I have a plan. And don't worry we will win. We have Athena's blessing after all. Athena? They were surprised. Beginning Operation Vokuta. Except nothing ever goes according to plan in this world. End of chapter.